Look, thanks very much to Padder uh, for the invitation. I'm, I'm really delighted to be down here. Um, this can be as discursive or interactive as you wish, so do please feel free to interrupt me or you can save up your questions for the end or complaints or criticisms or whatever. Um, I, I would, some of the things I'm going to say I'd really love to be wrong about. Um, so if people can kind of point me to reasons why I might be mistaken, then that would be much appreciated. So as Patter said, uh, my home is in the School of Electronic Engineering in Dublin City University. I'm affiliated with the Energy and Design Lab uh, in DCU. I'm currently the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering and Computing. I've been involved in climate change uh, activities probably for about nearly 15 years now, uh, which arose primarily in the engineering context. So. Uh, part of the challenge in engineering education is figuring out what it is we're supposed to be preparing engineers for, for the next, you know, for a working life, for the next 50 years. What is the world going to look like? What are the engineering challenges going to look like? Um, and, and having started a journey about 15 years ago when climate change really wasn't something uh, that featured at all, at all in my thinking um, about that kind of educational issue, it's slowly but progressively dawned on me uh, that it was very, very important and that we had to pay a lot of attention to it with the result that I've now spent an awful lot of time, maybe too much time, learning and trying to understand and trying to relate that to our educational programs. Um, I'm kind of bookending this series of post-Paris conferences. I know you had our talks, I know you had Cara Augustenberg and I know Cara and I have great respect for Cara and I admire her work very much, but we do disagree on some things. Um, and I noticed that in her uh, abstract for her talk, um, she said she wanted, th there's too much talk about climate change problems and not enough talk about climate change solutions. And I actually think that's about exactly the wrong way around. We have too much talk about solutions that aren't real solutions and too little talk about the real problem. Uh, and OK, I'm an engineer. That's my job. That's in the job description, problem solver. Um, but we solve problems by first understanding them and understanding them quantitatively in as far as we can, uh, and then designing solutions that will actually work if we possibly can. And, and by and large, engineers are fairly successful. You don't hear much about us. And the reason you don't hear much about us is because things work. If things didn't work a lot of the time, then you'd hear a lot more about engineers. Um, but that's our role in society. So I like to talk about the climate change situation uh, globally and locally, not as a problem to be solved. Because it's not like that. It's not an engineering problem that you're going to solve. It's a predicament that we're going to engage with, whether we like it or not. We can engage in a proactive, forward-looking way, or we can let things happen and then respond and react and everything in between those extremes. But we're not going to wake up one morning and say, oh, phew, we fixed that. Let's go on to the next thing. It's not that kind of uh, issue. It's, it's a predicament, not a problem. Anyway, we'll, we'll see whether you agree with me by the time we get to the end. Um, okay. Should work. So we're talking about the Paris Agreement. Hopefully most of you heard some of the media coverage during December about these big negotiations in Paris. This was the culmination of a long process going back at least six years. In fact, going back 20 years, really, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is the overarching uh, international agreement that these things take place under, um, goes back nearly 25 years. So this is, the, this is the backdrop before we arrived in Paris. So mitigation is a word we'll use over and over again. Mitigation has a technical meaning here. It means trying to avoid or limit the extent of human-caused climate change. How can we mitigate human-caused climate change? It's already happening. It's going to continue to happen for a long, long time. The rate, to some extent, is still under our control, and the ultimate destination, to a significant extent, is under our control. But it's going to happen anyway. It's already happening. Um, mitigation means, however, trying to limit the speed at which it progresses and how far it goes. And because the primary factor in 
modern climate change and human caused climate change, this geologically unprecedented, unprecedentedly rapid change in global climate. The driver for it is emissions of so-called greenhouse gases. They accumulate in the atmosphere, they change the thermal balance of the planet and the solar system, and the net result is the planet starts warming up. It'll eventually come into equilibrium for any given amount of stuff we, we throw into the atmosphere. The planet will eventually reach an equilibrium temperature. It takes quite a long time, it's a big planet, um, but it will eventually stop. But if it stops, while, while it's getting there, those temperature changes can potentially cause huge disruption in the way the atmosphere behaves, and the way we see that is as weather and as long-term weather or climate. So in a nutshell, global warming is the heating of the planet. Climate change is what happens as a result. And the reason the planet is warming is because we've changed the balance of heat coming in from the sun and heat radiating back out again by putting these special greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, particularly carbon dioxide uh, due to burning fossil fuels. So fossil fuels came from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So over a period of millions of years, that was drawn down from the atmosphere by biological organisms and wound up trapped in the crust of the planet. Now in a period of a few hundred years, a much, much shorter period of time, we're digging it out of the ground and putting it back into the atmosphere very, very suddenly. And that's dramatically changing the thermal balance of the planet. It's warming up and climate is changing as a result. So mitigation is trying to slow that down. Mitigation really means stopping putting this stuff into the atmosphere. Okay? Emissions reduction, as it's called. But we really need to get to, because it accumulates, we need to get to zero. As long as we keep putting more in there, it stays there for long periods of time. Carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere. A lot of it stays in the atmosphere for thousands of years. Okay, so once we put it up there, it's there for a very, very long time. It doesn't go away. So the mitigation message since 25 years ago when this issue really began to be properly understood as something that was potentially very, very dangerous, the mitigation message that we have to reduce those emissions, we have to reduce them quickly, has hardly changed in 25 years. But although that's been the message, our actions as a global human community have been the opposite. So over that same 25 years, the level of annual emissions, the extra amount we're putting in the atmosphere every year, has gone up by about 60% globally. So we've had the message, but we haven't actually been acting on it for a long, long time. Carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere today are higher than any time in the last 800,000 years, possibly much longer. It's hard to be precise, but at least 800,000 years. Human civilization, as we know it, dates from the current interglacial, from the end of the last ice age, about 12,000 years ago. Okay, 800,000 years, 12,000 years. So in the 12,000 years that we've had agricultural civilizations, uh, but particularly in the last 400 years, as we started to dig out these fossil fuels, we've been increasing the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to something that is at a rate that's just unprecedented. Okay, so this is it's a big issue, and that's where we were prior to Paris. Hey, everybody hugs, claps, cries, the case of Christiana Figueres. And, and it was great. Look, we had all this build-up, this dramatic, you know, we're going to have these crunch talks, we're finally going to deal with climate change, we just have to make this agreement. And, and then we'll be on our way. And, and this was the moment when all the parties uh, coming together at Paris said, yes, we have an agreement. Now, strictly speaking, it's not agreed yet, just to be clear. It's called the Paris Agreement, but it has to be ratified. And it doesn't come into effect until it's ratified to, to an extent that's technically defined in the agreement. So it'll probably take another 18 months, perhaps. There'll be a big signing ceremony uh, next month, the month after, in the UN to kick off that process. Um, but until a significant number of the parties involved covering a significant amount of the emissions have all signed up, it won't actually come into effect. But it probably will come into effect. I think we can be very, very optimistic 
that this agreement will be implemented in that sense. So the title here tonight was The Challenges of Implementation. Well, yeah, it, it'll get ratified and it'll get implemented. I'm pretty confident in saying that. And the reason I'm pretty confident in saying that is because technically it doesn't ask us to do very much. Okay. The Paris Agreement as a legal document, as a binding international agreement, commits the parties to it to no more than continuing to meet regularly, continuing to share their voluntary pledges for the mitigation they're going to do, to attempting to fund uh, an investment fund to help poorer parts of the world adapt to and transition to uh, a low carbon future. Um, but that's really it. Okay, and that, that'll be done. You know, we'll have the meetings. We'll have the sharing of these documents. So in that sense, implementation is easy. The difficult implementation is the aspirational stuff. Yeah, Ollie. But two of the four candidates in the American election don't want to implement it, most likely. They don't, they, they don't want to ratify it, yeah. no. They don't even want to do what I've just described as pretty easy. And the whole thing was watered down because of the United States. Yes. Okay, well, all right, let, let's motor on for a bit. <laughs> And, and we'll come back to that challenge later on, but we will come back to it. But as I said, I suppose this comes back to, this is a predicament, mm. and we will engage with it. You know, so whichever way things go in the US, we'll still be having to engage with it, and they'll still be having to engage with it, because it ain't going away. There is no other planet we're all suddenly going to move on to when things get bad here. Okay, they're already bad in certain parts of the world, they're already very bad in certain parts of the world. There are some great things. I mean, I said it was a diplomatic triumph, and it was genuinely a dif diplomatic triumph, as, as Ollie said. Right down to the wire, the final announcement of the agreement was delayed by several hours over one word to ensure that the Americans were still on board um, in, in Paris in December. Um, so it was a triumph of diplomacy in that sense. And it has very strong language on the objectives, on what everybody wants to see happen. Okay, stronger language than in previous communiques and agreements under the Framework Convention. So here's the strong language. The parties have agreed, they're committed to doing everything they can. Of course, they get to decide what they can do, but anyway, they're committed to doing everything they can to hold the increase in global average temperature to well below two degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels and pursue limits, pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to only 1.5 degrees. We're currently at about one degree above pre-industrial. That's where we're at already on the basis of emissions up to about 30 years ago. Not on the basis of the emissions up to now because the planet takes a long time to heat up. Okay, so the temperature we're seeing now reflects the emissions up to 20 to 30 years ago. We've still got a lot more warming already coming at us, okay? Uh, some people would say 1.5 is probably already guaranteed, but there's some, there's, it's a complicated system, there's uncertainty in it, we're not absolutely sure. Um, but that 1.5 is probably extraordinarily aspirational, not, not really something that can be delivered on. The two degrees is very, very difficult. Where's this two degrees come from? This is not a scientific number. Okay, that's a political number. Okay, just, you sometimes hear scientists have determined that two degrees is the limit, the red line that we must ensure the planet doesn't heat up beyond. No, there's no red line. You know, we'll wake up one day and we've gone past two degrees and the world will not end. Okay, or more accurately, there'll be one day when you pass it for the first time, and the following day it'll be cooler again. And for that year, it won't be above two degrees on average. It'll, you know, this, this is not something that happens just like that. But even two degrees is not a magic number. It's just a number that happens to be a round number in the Celsius scale that politicians latched on to. There's a gradation of impacts as we get warmer and warmer, and they're highly uncertain. And there will be certain temperatures that are very, very significant when we cross them, but we won't know that at the time. 
They'll be very, very significant because as we cross them, we'll trigger irreversible feedbacks that we can't go back on. It's simply winding the temperature back again won't undo them. But it's a very complex system. We don't know exactly what those temperature thresholds are, but we do know scientifically that as we go above 1.5 degrees, it gets progressively more dangerous. The risks go up very steeply. Okay? But there's no one temperature at which it suddenly goes from being safe to being dangerous. Okay? But the parties decided they needed a, a temperature goal to fix on, so they fixed on two degrees. Well, well below two degrees. Two degrees, the best scientific advice at the moment is that two degrees will be terrible. On a global basis, two degrees. It doesn't, and like, on, a, on a single day in Ireland, you can have a span of temperature of 10 plus degrees. Okay, so two degrees doesn't actually sound that bad. But this is a global average okay, over the whole planet. And it won't be two degrees, it won't be just two degrees everywhere. It'll be much warmer in some places. Much, much warmer, particularly in pol polar areas. Okay? And it doesn't take much of it, and it's over the whole year, averaged over the whole year. Okay? It doesn't actually take all that much of a temperature change on average over the whole globe to very drastically change the climate system. Okay? So we're already in, we're already seeing very strange things happening. Even here in Little Old Ireland, we're aware of that. Very weird things are happening. Um, but they'll get progressively weirder. Um, and at certain places, uh, in, in some places, it'll be much, much worse than others. But it is very unpredictable, but the risk uh, certainly goes up very substantially as we go above 1.5 degrees and approach 2. So the commitment is to undertake rapid reductions in emissions in accordance with the best science. I mean, what other basis would you do it on? So get the best science you can to advise you how quickly, how serious is this? How quickly do we need to do it, having adopted this temperature goal? And to do it on the basis of equity, because we haven't all contributed to this evenly, and we don't all have the same wherewithal to respond to it or adjust to it. So particularly, many of the people who will be first in impact live in poor parts of the world, they're very vulnerable, very vulnerable in food security, very vulnerable on sea level. And they've done the least to cause the problem because they haven't been industrialized. So they haven't been burning fossil fuels. They haven't had the benefits. They don't have the uh, material wealth that we have because they haven't been doing this for the last 300 years, whereas we have. So those of us who live in societies that have industrialized, who've had the benefit of that, are basically inflicting these damages on parts of the world that haven't even had the benefits. Okay, so it's hugely inequitable what is now happening. Now, that's not a moral, well, maybe it's a moral statement now. It's not a moral historical statement. Obviously, for most of that period of time, the people who were burning the fossil fuels didn't realize what the problem was. But the last 25 years, we've known. So now it is a moral equity question. Very strong language on objectives, um, but so the way this works, the way the Paris Agreement system works is that the parties voluntarily say, oh well, we'll reduce our emissions like this and fuel emissions, reduce your emissions like that, and okay, so everybody pools their promises, and because it's a global system, you then have to ask, well, in total, what does that add up to? So before Paris, everybody pooled their best promises, just to see, well, where are we? How, how, how badly constrained are we? And again, there's uncertainty on this. It's a complex system. But the promises that were lodged before Christmas probably would result in warming peaking at something of the order of 3.5 degrees centigrade. It might be only 2.5, it might be 4 degrees. It's crazy too hot. Completely crazy too hot. So those pledges were inadequate. So we know they're inadequate. So the Paris process basically says, well, okay, from here on we have to come back with increased ambition. But the clock is ticking. While we're thinking about increased ambition, we're continuing to emit. So every day, every hour, every minute that passes when we haven't really engaged in aggressive emissions reductions makes the requirement tomorrow much harder. Because I said, these gases are accumulating in the atmosphere. Basically, there's a fixed amount we can put up there, and we're using it up. And if we don't slow down, then we'll hit 
the limit much earlier. Okay, and the, the, the diplomatic process is very slow, very slow. So these voluntary pledges, uh, nationally determined contributions, will not actually be reviewed until 2020, five years' time. Or a better way of thinking about that is roughly 200 billion tonnes of CO2 from now. 200, I mean, I, I don't know. I, that, that number just, a tonne is quite a lot, you know? Are you, are you including in that, in that, that figure uh, the 200 billion that also the methane has been released? I'm not talking about methane, this is just it's carbon just dioxide. Okay. It's just carbon dioxide. Now, of course, there's methane. The methane story is complicated because methane is a short-lived gas. It does come back out of the atmosphere. Short-lived in terms of decades, not millennia. Um, it does take <laughs> some time. So the way you analyze CO2 is different, or methane is different from the way you deal with CO2. And, that, and that's, I don't want to go there tonight, and I'm not really an expert on it, but this number, the thing about CO2 is it stays up there. So that 200 billion further tons by 2020 will be there for thousands of years. Okay, or a sizable proportion of it at any rate. And, and so just imagine a ton and then imagine a thousand tons and then imagine a thousand thousand tons, that's a million tons. And then imagine another thousand and 200 times that. And that's just between now and 2020. Now, yes, the atmosphere is huge, but you can't reasonably think that putting this amount of pollution into the atmosphere is not going to make a difference. And that 200 billion is 200 billion we haven't got left it's 200 billion of space that is no longer available by 2020. Before we even talk about increasing our emission reduction targets. Okay. Aviation and shipping, they don't dominate, but they are significant. <coughs> They're significant sources of carbon dioxide emissions in particular. But they were left outside the Paris Agreement completely. They are just left outside. We're not going to deal with them as part of the Paris Agreement. And they're growing very quickly. Did you have any sense of how they compare with each other's aviation, more the same as shipping, shipping company? Not sure. Uh, they're probably about comparable. Aviation, depending, the, there's a complicated story about aviation. You can take the raw CO2 yeah. in tons, but then you can look at the fact that it's high in the atmosphere and that, yeah. so that there's complications with how you evaluate it, but something between 2 and 4% of annual t global emissions yeah. from aviation. I think shipping is somewhere around 5%, but I'm not absolutely sure of that. Combined, they represent uh, England and Germany together on an annual basis to conduct the emissions. And the funny thing about shipping, of course, is the very sizable proportion, 30 or 40% of it, is actually shipping fossil fuels. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. okay. um, in the agreement text itself, the, the phrase fossil fuels is not mentioned. The, the, the word decarbonization is not mentioned. That seems a bit weird. You're dealing with a challenge that involves fossil fuels, not burning them, and decarbonizing your energy system. You'd think it might make sense to say those things in the agreement. They're not said. They're not said because that language was unacceptable to certain parties. By parties here, we're talking about countries. And so you can imagine what countries are upset about signing up to an agreement that says we're going to stop burning fossil fuels. And they just said, well, you put that in there, we're not signing. So in order to get an agreement, certain things were left unsaid, but, it, but implied, obviously. You can't actually mitigate without stopping burning fossil fuels. But it's not stated in the agreement. The last one is critical. Um, again, you will not find any mention in the Paris Agreement of so-called negative emissions technologies. Negative emissions technologies, straightforward idea, what if? We had technologies which were the opposite of, you know, cars and power stations and all those things that, you know, they pump carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. What if we had a technology that sucked carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere? You know, we've been able to build that kind. Why can't we build this kind? If we can build this negative emissions technologies, you know, then we can just suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Um, again, that is not mentioned in the Paris Agreement. It would obviously be hugely impactful if we had that available to us. But the significance about it not being mentioned is that even though it's not mentioned, a lot of the other things that are said in there tacitly assume 
that it can be done. So it makes a huge difference whether or not it can be done or at what scale it can be done. So we'll come back to that later. But it's not explicitly mentioned. All right, so I mentioned this idea that carbon dioxide in particular accumulates in the atmosphere. That means we can, once we say there's a temperature target, two degrees or at least well below two degrees, we've got a forever budget. There's so much more carbon dioxide we can ever put into the atmosphere and then we're done. And we can actually calculate it or at least we can estimate it. Okay, so you pick a temperature. This is the scientists now. This you can do with science. You pick a temperature. We want it to be less than two degrees above pre-industrial. There are uncertainties, so do you want to be 66% sure that you won't exceed 2 degrees? Or is a coin toss 50-50 okay, or 33%? Now, if I was climbing on board an aeroplane and they told me at the door, now, you have a 66% chance of arriving at your destination safely. We're very proud of that. I think you'd turn around and go back. If they said, well, we've had a poor financial year, so we're down to 33% chance of arriving at your destination this year. I don't think you'd, you definitely wouldn't get on the plane. We're not talking about an airplane, we're talking about planet. We've only got one and we're all on it. And these are the risk numbers we're playing with. Okay. But anyway, depending what probability of keeping below two degrees you settle on, and that's a political decision, which isn't in the Paris Agreement, they use this language instead. They say, we want to stay well below two degrees, but they don't specify that numerically. So you have to interpret what the heck do they mean. Okay. But scientifically, if you want, on the best models we have, you pick one of those probabilities and you get a number, which is how much more carbon dioxide can we put in the atmosphere? Gigatons, billions of tons of carbon dioxide. Uh, counting from 2011, because that's just when they ran the numbers last. So these budgets are less today, because obviously we've put a lot more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere since 2011. But in round numbers, if you want a 66% chance of staying below 2 degrees, then we've got a budget left of a thousand, one more thousand billion tons. And remember we said we do 200 billion in the next five years. Okay, so that thousand there is, you know, 30 odd years left. And then you have to go to zero. If you keep going at a current rate, you then have to go to zero. Or if you actually grow in the meantime, then you're worse off. Okay. Um, that's for 66% chance. Obviously, if you're willing to live with more risk, you know, are you risk averse or not? What kind of investment do you want? If you're willing to live with more risk, then you can allow yourself more space, you can say, oh, we'll limit another 300. Or if you're down to 33%, we can go up to another 500 billion tons, which is, you know, less than 10 years probably of time. So really, it doesn't make a huge amount of difference what probability you choose here, because it only varies the length of time you've got for action by about 10 years, okay, at most. Um, so given that we're choosing between a planet that is, has an organized human civilization and one that doesn't, and all the suffering that, that goes along with that, me personally I'd prefer to stick with the smaller number, but you know, smaller number is obviously harder to live with them. Okay. Um, but that, that's, <laughs> hey, I'm an engineer. We, 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 we're always conservative. That's, that's why things work because we have error margins and all that. Okay. So we've got a, you get a range of carbon budgets, then these pledges, you can add them all up and you say, well, for those pledges, how much carbon dioxide will go into the atmosphere, ever? Okay. And if you plot those pledges on a graph, that runs from about 2011 through to 2050 or so. Um, you run those into the model, um, and the sort of pathway, this, this is emissions, this is gigatons per year on a global basis on the vertical axis. Okay. So basically if you take, you know, one year's worth would be 40 gigatons, a second year would be another 40 gigatons, a third year would be another 40 if you're staying flat. So it's basically the area underneath one of these pathways that is the total amount of carbon dioxide. Okay. 
These are the pledges. So this area here is roughly what we're talking about emitting. And it doesn't stop there. We keep on going. Okay. Um, to get to two degrees, or to stay below two degrees, we'd need something like that red line. Okay. That is to say, we'd need to reduce emissions globally extraordinarily quickly. Can we be more precise about that? Well, the Paris Agreement says we're going to stay well below, or we all agreed we want to stay well below two degrees. Well, the 66% chance budget is probably already gone. We, we've started too late. It's not literally gone, but realistically speaking, we're not going to stop quickly enough to stay within that budget. The 50% the chance conceivably is possible, it's conceivably physically possible. But you would need something like putting the whole planet on a war-like emergency footing where the sole priority for global humanity is to reduce and eliminate our continuing car uh, greenhouse gas emissions, particularly carbon dioxide, as quickly as possible, while protecting as best we can human welfare while we're doing that. Okay, if you did that, you could conceivably get to the level where we've got a 50-50 chance of staying below two degrees. Okay? There's no sign that that's going to happen. None whatsoever. None of the language in the Paris Agreement has that kind of urgency about it. So we're down to a 33% chance. For that budget, we would still need mitigation effort that's far beyond anything that politicians, at least, were talking about, or were introducing into their pledges ahead of time. Okay, it's just, and and the, if, you, if you take no other idea away from you today than this one, there's this huge chasm between the rhetoric and the reality of the action that would match that rhetoric. It's, just, it's, not, it's not a little tiny tweak. It's not just trying a little bit harder. It's a huge chasm. Okay. And, and it's, it's numbers. It's not rockets. Well, okay. Okay, it is rocket science, but the numbers can be calculated, and, and they are what they are. Uh, well, okay, so I, this, let, let's just talk about the 33% budget. It's not, not great odds, but it seems to be the shot that's on the board. That's a global budget, so you have to divvy that up. You have to say, well, who's going to emit how much? Now, you can, divvy it up, you can think about divvying it up in different ways. You can think about divvying it up geographically, different countries, different regions. You can also think about different people or different groups of people in society on a global basis. Some, some people in all societies are much higher emitters than other people in all societies. So not all individuals in society have the same profile of emissions by a long chalk. So that would be another way of talking about equity. You could talk about historical equity. I mentioned it earlier. Who's been most responsible to date? They should do the most now. But the Paris Agreement is structured on geographical equity, the, the countries making up the UN, so let's just take that equity idea. Um, so we have a global CO2 budget for, let's say, a 33% chance of staying below 2 degrees, and the scientists can tell us what that budget is. We've got it in black and white. We can then say, well, let's look at the poor countries in the world, or, or the less developed industrialising countries. I'm including China here. It's relatively still, although it has come on a long way in the last 20 years, comparatively speaking, it's still in the process of industrialising. So we can estimate the absolute maximum effort that those could reasonably make on any basis of equity. And they, they've done the least to cause this problem. So what could the rich parts of the world reasonably ask them to do? Okay. So if we do that for them, then we'll say, okay, that means they're going to get this much. Okay. And then you take that away from the original budget, and you know what we've got left. And then you can say, well, okay, how long will that last us? What, what do we need to do? What level of action is required? So I should have said at the start, we, we had a couple of weeks ago, we had the great pleasure of having Professor Kevin Anderson from the University of Manchester in Dublin. 
Uh, he's Professor of Energy and Climate Change, and he's also Deputy Director of the UK Tyndall Centre for Climate Change Research. Um, and I've stolen a lot of his slides. Okay. Now, any errors here are my fault, not Kevin's fault, but uh, just give due acknowledgement to Kevin. And anybody who was at any of Kevin's talks, uh, you'll see some familiar numbers here. So let's suppose that poorer nations peak their emissions within 10 years. Now remember, they're trying to drag people out of poverty. These are the poorer countries in the world. Yes, in China, there's perhaps 300 million people who have a standard of living similar to Europeans, similar to the average Europeans, but there's still a billion Chinese that are well below that. Okay, so there's at least two billion people in the world who are in extreme poverty. Okay, and the way we have come out of extreme material po poverty is by exploiting fossil fuels, and we're saying, Yes, we did that, and it's great. Thank you very much, but you can't do it. We'll give you 10 years. Okay, but then you'll have to stop. Well, you'll definitely have to stop growing your usage by then. So th this, this is a huge ask. And then, it's not that they can stay flat then. They then have to de decrease their emissions. Let's make it really aggressive. Let's say that by another 10 years later, they're reducing their emissions at 10% per year. And by 2050... Well, they're 15 years after that, their emissions have gone to zero. Now, this is a crazy, aggressive ask for countries that really have done the least to cause this problem. Okay? But I'm trying to make, you know, give us the maximum possible space to continue doing what we're doing. Okay? But just when we say fully decarbonize their energy systems, we mean fully, th this is not complicated. No more carbon dioxide. You've stopped. Okay, you're just not doing it anymore. Well, you run the arithmetic and you discover that we rich countries, the countries that are left, um, would need to reduce our emission rates starting now, today, this year, by about 10% per year, year every year. Every year. So by five years' time, we would have reduced our emissions by 50% compared to 1990. By 2025, we'd, be down to, we'd have reduced by 75%. By 2030, 90%. And by 2035, 20 years away, we would have fully decarbonized all energy. Now, the, the agriculture methane question is on top of this. needs a separate discussion. But this is just energy, carbon dioxide, primarily from energy. A lot from cement as well, but car, the, the, the energy bit dominates. 90% okay. by 2030. What was the European, the EU pledge that Ireland was, party, was part of? Uh, we said, and, and we thought we were breaking our hearts, we said by 2030 we would have reduced our emissions by 40% against 1990. 40%. Whereas the numbers here, which involve leaving, you know, really, this is the most minimal interpretation conceivable of equity for the other parts of the world, okay, would need to see us reducing by 90% by 2030. Okay. Of course, we're not doing that. We've no plan to do that. But just, again, come back to it. The arithmetic here says that each year that goes by that we don't do this, then if we're serious about limiting temperature rise to two degrees, then the subsequent year, we have to ratchet up. If we're only going to start reducing emissions faster the following year, then we have to do it much, much faster. Okay, because it's zero sum. Once we put it in the atmosphere, it's there. That space is no longer available. If we've used it this year, we don't have it to use next year. If we've used it this year, we don't have it to use in 20 years' time. If we want to husband this remaining capacity of the atmosphere, we need to start reducing radically now so that we're able to keep on doing some emissions for longer so that we have more time to adjust. Okay? We don't have to do this. If we don't do it, of course, the planet says, fine. It keeps warming. And the climate keeps changing. And the impacts grow. You know, so th this is not just we can close our eyes and say, well, we don't like that message so we're just going to ignore it. I mean, we can do that. 
but it doesn't make the problem go away or it doesn't make the predicament go away. 2035, yeah, okay. of course you all know it's only two decades away or five governments, is that about right? Four. Four or five, mm. could be. Six. Could have three this year, so, <laughs> you know. <sighs> okay, sorry. I did have a slide with Artesia Gandakani. This is, because you think he's speaking in 2014. And I have occasion to speak with politicians and policy makers, and certain words come up all the time pragmatic, realistic, practical. Okay, but you have to be practical, Barry. You have to, you know, we're, we're on board with you, but you have to understand there's limits to what's possible, and we have to be practical. And so, as, as Enda Kenny said, I don't want whatever administration or whatever government is in office in Ireland from 2020 to 2030 to be completely screwed by virtue of a wrong base upon which targets were set originally for 2020. Well, he's got it right in one sense. The targets were set on a completely wrong base. Okay. But they were far too high, not far too low. And yes, we will be completely screwed along with everybody else. But it'll, Well, if we're lucky, it'll take us a few decades longer than, let's say, people in Bangladesh. Um, I'm not sure that that's a very nice way of thinking about it, but that's, as I say, that's currently the plan. Because we're richer, we have more resources to respond to and protect ourselves against immediate impacts. Because we happen to live in a temperate part of the world, the rate at which the climate changes may not be quite as fast here as in certain other parts of the world, uh, where they're more vulnerable to relatively small changes in climatic patterns. So we may last a bit longer, but we're not, we're not on some other planet. And anyway, we're part of a globalized trading economy. So these kind of climatic damages, if we allow them to get really, really severe, they will disrupt the global economic order and our ability to function in the manner that we like functioning uh, will get impacted, even if our local weather is still quite fine. Thank you very much. Um, but anyway, and this is, I have sympathy for the endocanies of this world because they say, but you know, Barry, I hear what you're saying, but you must be wrong. And the reason you must be wrong is because I've got these other advisors who are telling me, yes, we do have to act on climate, but it's not going to be a problem because we can act aggressively and we'll have green growth and we'll have, you know, it'll, it, it, it'll be wonderful. We'll, we'll have this whole new post-carbon world with new economic opportunities that we're going to participate in. Now... The numbers I showed you there indicated emissions reduction by 10% per year, every year from here on in. There's no economist in the world that thinks that can be done in a way that's compatible with economic growth. In fact, there's no ec economist that thinks it can be done in a way that's compatible with the current economic system. That's already actually something like a war like mobilization. Okay. But I, I suggested to you that that's what the science tells us coupled with equity. So the best science with equity, which is what the agreement said we were going to work with. That's what it says. And yet, the IPCC, Working Group 3, those of you who are in the know will recognize what Working Group 3 is, but it's the one that has all the economists in it. <laughs> working Group 3, or for Patter's benefit, it's the one that has all the social scientists in it. Working Group 3 co-chair November 2014 says that mitigation costs for 2 degrees centigrade would be so low the global economic growth would not be strongly affected. How did they do that? Science. Uh, science, <laughs> yeah. What was the name of the co-chair? Uh, I think that's... It, it, it's... Utmar... Is it? I think he's actually on our Climate Change Advisory Council. Um, so how, how, do they, how do they square that? Well, they square it because they think that technology is going to save us. And I'm afraid this is a bugbear of mine. I said at the beginning I was an engineer. I'm not a scientist, I'm an engineer. And there's a difference, okay? Scientists tell you what's impossible. Engineers tell you what's possible. Now that sounds weird, okay? So let me give you an example. 
something that would really make a huge difference to our predicament would be if we had a really, really good source of humongous amounts of energy that didn't involve emitting carbon, carbon dioxide. And scientifically, we know that's possible. Okay? It's called fusion energy, nuclear fusion energy. It's clean. There's limitless, effectively limitless supplies of fuel. Fuel's easy to get. And we know it works. We know it works because in the early 1950s, we started exploding hydrogen bombs, and that's the way hydrogen bombs work. So we've proven that it works scientifically. So it's not impossible. Okay? And they said, okay, engineers, off you go and you know, do it. And some of the best engineers in the world have spent the last 60 years trying to actually make it work in a controlled way. And they've made progress, but the progress is coming droppingly slow. And it's nowhere near, there, there's no serious engineering likelihood that we'll have that ready on a time scale that would work for this. So just because something is scientifically not impossible doesn't mean that from an engineering point of view we can actually do it. But the scientists behind this have decided that anything that is scientifically possible, if we go a few decades into the future, we can safely assume that it will be made practical. But they don't know how to do that. They say, oh, the engineers will look after that. And that's what's happening. And, and so the two rabbits in the IPCC hat that they rely on to do this are called negative emissions technology and time travel. I'll come to time travel in a second. Negative emissions technology, I mentioned it earlier, the, the commonly proposed way of doing this, there are other possibilities, but commonly way, proposed way is so-called BEX. Uh, Bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. So the idea is there is a way to suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Plants do it. Okay? It's what chlorophyll in plant leaves does. Basically sucks carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, turns it into sugars and other things, um, but long car molecules with carbon in them uh, that can be solid or liquid and you, know, you can eat them, which is what we normally do to get energy ourselves, directly or indirectly. So that's perfectly scientifically well established. It works. Okay? It actually works in an annual cycle. You can see it. If you look at carbon dioxide in an annual cycle, you see it going up and down as the northern hemisphere comes into summer and out of summer because in summer we get lots more leaves, a lot more carbon dioxide is sucked out of the atmosphere. In the winter they fall, they decay, the carbon dioxide goes back into the air. Completely scientifically works. So if we just build out, sorry, plant out enough land to capture, the, now this assumes that we've already either run out of or voluntarily shut down our fossil burning. So we're no longer, or we're burning very little, if any, fossil fuels by this stage. We're talking about the second half of the century. So we plant out large areas of land with crops. We still need energy, of course. We plant out these areas of land. They capture sunlight, energy, sun energy. Um, and then they've taken carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, but we want the energy because we're not burning fossil fuels. So we need the energy. So we burn them. But if we just burn them, that will release the carbon dioxide back out into the atmosphere and we haven't made any progress. So now we'll capture, as we're burning it, we'll put devices onto the flues and we'll capture the carbon dioxide from the exhaust gases. Okay, great, so it's not gone into the atmosphere. Well, actually, if you're lucky, you'll capture 80, 90% of the carbon dioxide. You won't capture it all. But anyway, park that for a second. We'll capture the carbon dioxide as we're burning it. Um, and we'll store it. Well, actually, carbon dioxide is this gas. It's not easy to store. So, okay, well, we'll compress it hugely to a point where it's nearly a liquid, and then we'll pump it underground, and we'll keep it underground in geologically stable formations for thousands of years. And we'll do this year after year, each year storing hundreds of billions of tons of CO2. We'd need a land area, something between one and three times the land area of India. So we need another two or three Indias. Unless we're going to stop growing food crops. Because we don't have another India that isn't already planted out. Okay, so this is, this is the plan. And... You know, 
Scientifically, each step of this is possible. It's not impossible. There's nothing in the laws of physics or chemistry that says you can't do any step of this. And they've been demonstrated on tiny scale. But seriously? Now, this is something that's worth investigating, it's worth doing research on, it's worth piloting. But deciding today that we're going to continue burning fossil fuels today because we're going to assume that in 40, 50, 60 years' time, we'll be able to do that. So before the planet notices that we've put too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we'll be sucking it back out again and storing it safely under the ground. <sighs> this is insane. And yet, something like 70% of the IPCC scenarios assume that we'll be able to do the scenarios for two degrees, assume we will be able to do that, because they're written by scientists, not engineers. Or time travel. Well, time travel is an obvious way of fixing this. If we could go back in time, we could stop doing this at an earlier stage, and then we'd have more time. No, that's not what we mean here. Actually, of course, nobody in the IPCC is suggesting we could do that. Okay? But a significant number of the scenarios that we're still using from the IPCC assume that global emissions peaked in 2011 already and started falling at that time. Now, if they had, and they were, then we'd be in a much better place. But they didn't. And yet, we're still relying on these scenarios that imagine that they did, which means we're relying on scenarios that are essentially thinking we can get into a time machine and go back and make global emissions peak in 2011. Now, if, if they wrote that down in English and said that's what they're assuming, of course, nobody would take it seriously. But that's tacitly what's in there. Um, so that's 86% rely on large-scale negative emissions. The remaining 14% rely on the global peak in 20, about 2010. Many of them assume both of these things. Okay. So that's the way you can make it add up. That's the way you can persuade yourself that, no, we don't need to reduce emissions by 10% year on year from here on. Okay. But we need to be very, very clear that that's the trade-off we're making. This is the weird bargain that we're making with our children. Okay, they're not getting to ask us about this. On their behalf, we're deciding that we think in 50 years' time they will be lucky enough to have the technologies that will fix the mess that we've decided is just too hard for us to avoid leaving. Okay. Um, back to my conversations with politicians. Um, you have to be practical, Barry. You have to be realistic. Uh, Richard Feynman, famous physicist, uh, he was a member of the Presidential Commission on the Shuttle Disaster Challenger in 1986, uh, where in effect what I call it, business decisions, business priorities, trumped engineering advice. So that when you boil it all down, the reason the Challenger blew up was because it shouldn't have launched on the day it launched. And it shouldn't have launched on the day it launched because temperatures were too low. The engineers knew they were too low. They knew that the rubber seals on the solid fuel booster rockets had a significant possibility of failing if they launched at that temperature. Wasn't guaranteed, might be okay, but they were very unhappy with the level of risk. From the point of view of the company, the contractor they were working for, who manufactured the solid fuel boosters, and from the point of view of NASA, delaying the shuttle launch had already been launched, uh, delayed several times, delaying again would be very bad PR, and they didn't want to do it. So a business decision was taken, taken that the launch should go ahead. And the advice was changed. The advice from the contractor to NASA. NASA didn't want to hear they shouldn't launch. And the contractor knew they didn't want to hear. And the contractor decided we'd better tell them what they want to hear as opposed to what they don't want to hear. And this was Feynman's conclusion. For successful technology, reality must take precedence over public relations. Because reality will have the last word. That's why we've got a predicament. We can say, no, it's 
not realistic to reduce our emissions at those kinds of rates. And you can, you can say that. Maybe you're right. But you're not talking about physical reality. You're talking about political and social reality. But I, we're not going to change physical reality. But we might have some chance of changing political and social reality. So I think maybe we should try that. Or at least we shouldn't just deem it impossible that we could change that reality. Um, well, you can focus on the high emitters. There's actually not that many of us. Us. Um, we're high emitters. Well, I, I don't know. Maybe not everybody in the room. I'm a high emitter, I know. Um, anybody who lives the typical Western industrialized lifestyle, middle class upwards, you know, if you take one or two long haul flights a year, it's not the emissions from the long haul flight I'm talking about. That's just a proxy for the kind of lifestyle that you have. If you're in that category, then you're in the high emitter category. Okay. Um, probably 200 million people account for 50% of global emissions, a global population of 7 billion. So it's not everybody. It's not just certain countries, actually. Some countries are higher on average than other countries, but within any country, you'll find some high emitters. Okay, but we could focus on the high emitters, at least in the short term, and it is a timing thing. We need to build out low energy, or sorry, zero carbon energy infrastructure, not low carbon energy infrastructure. It's too late for that. Okay, we don't have time. We have to go directly to zero carbon energy infrastructure. We need to build that out as fast as we can, but that won't be fast enough, because again, that's an engineering task. Okay, it's only so fast we can do it. And there are difficulties and challenges, not, not at all like the difficulties and challenges of doing BECs, but there are difficulties and challenges. But, so we need to do that as fast as we possibly can. But while we're doing that, while we're waiting to have a global zero carbon energy infrastructure, then we need to ramp down, particularly the energy usage, but more generally the emissions of the high emitting people which in countries like Ireland is maybe 50% of the population or maybe 70% of the population. Not 100% of the population, not everybody, but a lot of people would need to reduce their emissions. We could focus on them, there are ways of doing that. And, and we have to build out zero carbon energy supplies. That's what it would take on a global basis, but as I say, there's no, well, sorry, yeah, on a global basis, but certainly on the basis of the countries that have most of the big emitters, which would include us. Um, Again, there's just no sign of that happening. So I'm going to... That sounds like a terrible note to end on. Parting thoughts. So that kind of emissions reduction is impossible or impractical or unrealistic. Politically unacceptable. Inconceivable. But... Continuing on the trajectory we're on, with the implications that that has, the risk it implies for disruption of the global climate system, potentially irreversibly, is unthinkable. So we're trapped between the impossible and the unthinkable. Okay. So. What is in Ireland's national interest? Because again, every time I talk to people about this, they say, oh, you know, well, we're this one small country. Well, every, every group of five million people is a small set of the world population. So they can say, well, we're only a small part of the problem. But actually, as a, a relatively high emitting five million people, we're a bigger part of the problem than lots of other sample five millions. Um, what's actually in our national interest? What's in our national interest is to stop climate change. We're not going to be immune to this. So imagining that it's a higher priority for us to preserve our current economic competitiveness system, consumption level, whatever word you want to use, that that's the only thing that's in our national interest. As if, and it is the case, whatever about our individual contribution, while you've got countries, back to the American case, while you've got countries that absolutely refuse to engage, then that contaminates the possibility for global action. Okay. That is not in our, what's, what's in our national interest is successful global action. 
That's what's in Ireland's national interest, because we are on the same globe as all these other countries. What can we do to enhance the chances of that? Well, we could be say, you know, we could have a diplomatic core. Ireland does have this huge diaspora, this huge access to political influence on a global basis. At least we tell ourselves we do. I think we probably do in reality. Okay, we could give it a new mission. We could say you have one mission, and we're going to resource you up for this. It's not actually very expensive. We're going to give you fifty or hundred new specialists, and you're going to spend the next decades going around the world, just constantly campaigning, negotiating within Europe with every other nation in the world, trying to persuade them to engage more aggressively with this mitigation. We could do that. It wouldn't be hugely expensive. Of course, it would lack all credibility if we weren't doing more ourselves at home. So actually, that doesn't work unless we do a lot more ourselves. So those two things go hand in hand. Okay. But I think we could do more on that. At the moment in Europe, and, and we have significant influence in Europe, at the moment we are actively deploying our maximum diplomatic effort in Europe to impede greater ambition on climate change mitigation. Now you won't read that in newspapers every day, but that's what's actually happening. Okay, so not only are we not deploying our diplomatic effort in a positive way, because we feel that higher ambition potentially would be problematic for us, we're arguing against increased ambition. We're not aligning ourselves with partners in Europe who are in favor of increased ambition. We're aligning ourselves with member states of the European Union who are against increased ambition. Okay, so we're actually, whatever level of possibility there would be for increased ambition, we're actually working against it. And that's not in our national interest. It just isn't. Okay. I mentioned this two degrees, and I've talked about it, and I've used it as the premise for this. It's in the Paris Agreement. But again, I don't think it's actually all that useful because we're going to breeze through it. Okay, and we're going to wake up one day, and we've gone through it. And the world is still here, and we still have problems. So every day, there's going to be better choices and worse choices. Okay. So I, I, I think we need to engage with that predicament. But that also means that this is not, it's not like a storybook. It's not like, you know, the Hollywood blockbuster where you've got 90 minutes and at the end there's a resolution. Okay, it's not like a war where you fight it for five years and then win, lose or draw, it's over or whatever. Uh, this is more like a war of attrition. It's more like a hundred year war. That might be a better analogy for it. Okay, so... We need to get used to constantly questioning, well, yesterday this was impossible. Is it any more possible today? What more can we do today? What other action can we take today? Okay. Where can we find a new opportunity to do something different, to make something that seemed impossible yesterday possible today? And we don't know what will... What will we know that huge social changes can happen relatively quickly. Okay, we're celebrating this year, 19, we're celebrating, commemorating 1916. Um, we're not specifically, but I, I'd like to look a little bit further back than 1916. I'd like to look back to Daniel O'Connell. Daniel O'Connell, we know him in Ireland, of course, for Catholic emancipation and for land reform. Daniel O'Connell was also hugely influential in the global overturning of slavery. But when he started talking about this, he was an extremely lonely voice. And he was told, go away, don't talk about this. This is impossible. It's unthinkable. You know, it's just economically not doable to do away with slavery. And yet, we did it. It turned out to be possible after all. It was a social revolution. So these things do happen. Okay, so we, and, and that's the difference between physical reality and social reality. Social reality, it will change anyway like it or not, but we can try and steer the changes if we're active. Um, I, I can't answer the last question for you. Uh, I think and I'm in the eco-village. You know, I think you guys are great, so I have nothing to teach you, I don't think, um, in that. Um, I'm Kevin Anderson, thumbs up.
DCU, thumbs up. Antashka, I'm a member of the Climate Change Committee on Antashka, which I think of as a group therapy sort of thing. You kind of have to maintain your sanity. My dear, beloved, and very patient wife is in the background there. Um, she keeps me going. Uh, Owen will recognise this quote. I've been using it in a course in DCU recently. Never let the future disturb you. You will meet it if you have to. None of us know how long we'll be on this earth. So take one day at a time. You'll meet the future when it arrives. You can only deal today with the things you can deal with today. So you'll meet the future with the same weapons of reason, or you can choose to meet it with the same weapons of reason, which today arm you against the present. Marcus Aurelius, Emperor of Rome, but uh, Rome, there was still some centuries from the final collapse of the Roman Empire. Remember, the Roman Empire at the time was among the greatest human civilizations ever, and yet it collapsed. It can happen. It can happen suddenly, uh, relatively suddenly. Um, and there are lots of different reasons why these things happen, but simply assuming that because you look around at a society and it seems like the way, ways we do things, the ways we are doing things are, are just fixed and rigid and can never change, you know, that just ain't the case. We've got human history, long human history that tells us that just ain't so. So things will change, we just have to find the right places as that change unfolds to try and make the change more positive than negative. I don't think I had any more. That's it. Thanks, folks. <laughs> and